Hi, I'm Roland Kawakami. I'm from Ohio State University. And so this is a, a very nice summer school. And what I'm going to do is um, tell you about uh, 2D materials Pintronics. And it's really a tutorial. And there's sort of two parts. One part is the tutorial part, where I'm trying to um, go as basic as possible on some key concept in Spintronics, okay, and also somewhat how it relates to 2D materials. And, um, you know, I teach a semester long course in Spintronics, and there's also some other kind of tutorial talk. I've actually never given this talk, that part of the talk, with any professors in the room, right? This is like for first and second year grad students. So for this first part, I may not hit all the topics, but I'm going to ignore all these professors in the front. Okay, and you guys can feel free to ask questions any time. Okay, I may, I may pause after each topic. And then, um, but this seems like we're also talking about new results. And I want to, so we have some new results. So almost the last decade, I've always talked about spin transport and graphene because it's so nice. But just in the past couple of years, um, we've been doing work. One is on optospintronics, so using like circularly polarized light to generate spins uh, in 2D heterostructures. And then um, also on 2D magnets, right? So we've been making these monolayer magnets. It's a pretty hot topic. There's, it's been brought up a couple of times today. And uh, yeah, so we just got our first paper out a couple months ago. And um, I'll talk about one or both of those depending on how the time goes. Oops, let me start my time here, OK? And uh, we'll, we'll just play that by ear. And I think, I think both of those are very uh, exciting new research directions. All right, but this first part will be very basic, and I might go through a little bit uh, quick. Okay, so because people have already talked about this today. So, you know, here's graphene. It's, you know what it is? It's carbon sheets with, uh, made by scotch tape, typically. And we have these Dirac points over here. We've seen all this. Okay, that's the first part. So there's a linear dispersion. And for the charge transport, one thing that you want to do is to... Um, you know, use these gates that everyone has talked about. Maybe, maybe you all know a lot about this. Um, you know, but you can have, imagine some graphene with a back gate or with a top gate. And the basic picture is it's a capacitor, right? So you apply a voltage, Q equals CV, right? Apply a voltage, you get charge. And so you're able to, to tune with a gate the, ch the charge density on the graphene. So. Okay, this is bit, it's like this. But I guess my point is everything, so you, you, most of you know about this. It's almost embarrassing for me to show this to you. But there's a lot of things about the spintronics that you probably don't know. Not, probably most majority of you are not doing spintronics. But they'll all be sort of explained at this kind of level. So I tried to make it as simple as possible. Okay? Yeah, so if the gate's positive, you're going to get electrons. If the gate's negative, you're going to get holes. Okay, simple. Okay. And more of the same. Okay. And here is, you can look at this in the video. This is a, a quick derivation that you would do in an undergraduate kind of capacitor electricity class. Okay, fine. So I'm um, speaking so of very specific relations, but I'm just sort of going through this. And this is kind of nice. Um, one thing you could do uh, if you have two gates, like a top gate and a back gate, you can do two separate things. One is that you could change the electron density of graphene. So if you put the same uh, voltage on top and bottom, then you're going to be changing the electron density of graphene. But if you happen to be putting opposite voltages on, you know, modulo, you know, dielectric constants and thicknesses and stuff, if you put opposite um, voltages on, you can get these vertical electric fields, right? So you can, you can independently tune the carrier density and the electric field. And, you know, this can be super cool. Like if you did it in bilayer graphene, you can actually open up gaps. And you can even, it turns out, you can control the spin properties, like, really interesting. So we're trying to, we'll put it on the archive within a week. So please look, look for that. Um, so, so that's, you know, basic of sort of very, very basic concept in the charge transport. Now, I want to I sort of give similarly basic concepts uh, for the spin transport in graphene. You know, and there's this idea of spin resistance and spin absorption and conductance mismatch. So I would, I would gather that most of you won't know so much about that. Now, let, let, me, let me tell you about uh, the type of devices that we look at. Here is, can you see? Oh, it's my arrow. Okay, that's not so good. Um, so the typical kind of device um, for spintronics is not a, a spin, not, a, not a transistor, but these spin valves. And the main difference is, for example, you have electrodes, and they'll be made out of ferromagnets. Because ferromagnets have a spin polarization, right? So you can use those to inject spin and detect spin and so forth. Right? And so this is the type of device you have with a lot of cobalt electrodes. 
And you need four of them for the you know, basic measurement called non-local measurement. Okay, so this is, this is the non-local measurement. And, and let me describe this to you. So you have um, one cobalt electrode, that's gonna be the spin injector. And then you have a second uh, electrode, which will be the spin detector. And then you have these sort of reference electrodes. And what happens is you use a current on this first two pair, and that will create, uh, by spin injection, it'll create spin polarized electrons inside the graphene. And then, you know, there'll be a charge current going to the left, but you'll get a pure spin current going to the right. So this is a spin, it's a flow of spins without a net flow of charge. So I'll, I'll show you that. And then when they, when they get over the channel here, you can just measure a voltage, and the voltage will be proportional to the spin density underneath the electrode. All right, so that's the idea. And the concept of this came from Mark Johnson and Bob Silsby, 85, actually quite a long time ago. And the idea of this pure spin current, you can imagine like you have a spin up going to the right and a spin down going to the left. So there's a sense of a net flow of angular momentum, spin angular momentum, even though the charge current's gonna cancel, right? And typically what's happening here is the electrons are bouncing around and diffusing. And on average, the spin you know, up is kind of going towards the right, if you can think about it like that, without net charge. Okay, um, and another way to look at it is just to think about it in terms of, you know, a chemical potential. So if I have a ferromagnet, it has asymmetry of up and down spins. And then when I apply a bias, you start like shoving a bunch more spin ups into the non-magnetic material. So it starts populating it like crazy and it has to stay charge neutral. So what's happening is you get this chemical potential, which is like a local voltage for spin up, which is different than spin down. Right? And then, so this splitting is something that you could detect with a magnetic electrode, right? And so the, the kind of measurements that you would do are like this. Uh, okay, let me, you know, my grad student animated this. Okay, so, and I never changed, this, I never changed the slide. Okay, so, <laughs> so, the, so the idea is you do a spin injection, both from spin up, and then what you do is you'll detect with the ferromagnet, and in one case, it'll be a parallel magnetization, and the other case, it'll be anti-parallel. And what happens is that um, when your magnet uh, detector is in the same direction, you're going to be, you know, measuring um, right here, you're measuring the spin up chemical potential. So this is that spin splitting I showed you, the mu up and mu down. And as you go to the right, um, your polarization decays, so then the splitting decays. But, but this, vol this, uh, this uh, voltage probe is going to probe the spin up. Whereas if, if this is pointing down, it's going to probe the spin down. Right, and so the voltage is measured from the left, this electrode here, ferromagnetic one, to the non-ferromagnetic one, which just m measures this kind of zero. So here you have a positive voltage, and here you have a negative voltage, right? And then, and the main difference is when this when this electrode flips over, you see a, a abrupt change in your voltage, and then you say that's a spin signal. And the data looks more like this. So this is a room temperature data, and there's some actually some background which I've subtracted off. I wish I hadn't, but the idea is that you'll have um, these, these uh, two electrodes pointing parallel, but to the negative direction. And then you start ramping your field. And at a certain point, one of those electrodes flips, so you go to anti-parallel state, and then your, then your voltage that you measured will change, and then it will come up. And we call this uh, resistance, but we sort of define this resistance as that voltage you measured divided by the current that you drive through the system. So it's really just a, really a voltage measurement, but it's sort of a convention to call it a re non-local resistance, okay? Right, and so when you start seeing this type of thing, you're like, okay, I have spins making it across the channel, and this is the spin transport at room temperature. Um, there, so there's this, um, there's this concept of like, you know, let's imagine you have some spins, and then what determines how these spins move around, right? That's, it's, it turns out the spin flow can be different from the charge flow, okay? And if you, you know, if you have this spin up minus spin down, this is a spin density, is proportional to this um, chemical potential difference. And it turns out the thing that determines what, um, how it's gonna flow is this thing called spin resistance. So this is the regular resistivity of the material. And this is the spin diffusion length, which is sort of how far the spins would like to diffuse, and divided by cross-sectional area. So this looks like the definition of resistance, right? With rho L over A, but instead of the length of your resistor, this is a spin diffusion length. So the, the, the key idea is that the spin's gonna diffuse towards regions that have lower spin resistance, right? So any place that has lower resistance, like, you know, if you had uh, silicon, 
Um, the resistivity is higher than if it was copper. So metals, it likes to flow into regions of, of lower resistance or higher conductance, okay? And then, yeah, so that's the main thing. And so when, in the early days of the field, you know, we, we just put the cobalt on the graphene and we we're like, wow, this is really inefficient. But the problem is that, you know, you can inject these spins, but a lot of them will like to go back into the cobalt because that's, the cobalt's a metal, so its resistance is low, resistivity is low. So you get a whole lot of backflow um, and you lose a lot of what you put in, it comes back out. And to enhance this, uh, to fix this problem, and everyone knew how to do this in principle, is you just have to grow a, a thin layer of insulator. So what happens is that you'll inject inside, but this will provide a barrier. Um, it has a large spin resistance, so it won't allow this backflow to happen. And it keeps everything inside the graphene. And so folks like Rashba and Furt um, figured this out early on in, in, the, in the sort of the semiconductor spintronics um, uh, research, right? So, so the only challenge is to make nice films growing on graphene, and if you do epitaxial growth on graphene, you notice that everything sort of balls up, doesn't want to be so smooth. So, you know, so we did various, we did various tricks on that. Okay, so, um, but I won't, I won't get into that. Okay, so, so, so that's sort of the spin injection, spin transport part of the deal. Um, another thing that you could do in these same devices is actually figure out, you know, what's the spin lifetime, like how long, you know, once you create some spin polarized electrons inside a material, how long is it going to stay polarized, you know, how, how quickly do you lose that information, okay? And so it turns out you can do the exact same measurement um, where you have an injector and a detector, but what you do is you actually apply the magnetic field in a different direction, you make it perpendicular, and that's going to cause these electron spins to process, okay? And um, there's roughly a, a, a sort of an equation here that, that describes uh, what, what's here. And it has sort of a term here that looks like a diffusion. So if you know the dif diffusion of particles and so forth, this, is, this first part is the diffusion. So it's like a Gaussian that sort of spreads out over time. You have this thing here, which is cosine omega L over T, which is, this is like the magnetic field, so they'll process. So that's this term. And then this last part is that actually the polarization is going to be decaying. So, so you just put all those inside there and you integrate them, okay? And that's going to be your signal. And the point is um, you're going to get these kind of curves. And, you know, you originally start off um, with a maximum spin polarization, making it to the end. But the moment you turn on the, the field, you start dephasing these guys. And then you start losing the net polarization, right? And so this is intuitively how you look at that. And the nice thing is if you actually can fit this data, which is these solid lines, you could extract out um, spin lifetime, right? So even though you're not doing a time resolve measurement like to get the lifetime, because you're doing this procession business, you can actually pull out the lifetime and it turns out to be a sad like 80 picoseconds <laughs> because theoretically they say you should get like a microsecond and okay, but this is not a perfect system, okay? So yeah, yeah, so when the first, when the first work was done, um, out, out of the Netherlands group, they got like 100 picoseconds, so everything looks great about it. it. Even works at room temperature, but the lifetime seems too short. Okay, so, uh huh. So um, the thing that um, the thing that this equation we had here doesn't take into account is that actually um, these spins can actually get sucked back into the electrodes, like I, I told you early on. And uh, let me let me just get to sort of the, a punchline here. So, so in the early days, we made these direct contacts and we got these 80 picoseconds. And then a little while later, folks started putting, trying to make tunnel barriers to make everything work better, but they tended to have pinholes, okay? And, but the lifetimes are a little bit better, okay? So you make higher contact resistance and you get this 130 picoseconds or so. It's even better. Um, and it turned out the moment that you can make really nice tunnel barrier contacts, you know, without pinholes. Uh, and then, then the, the lifetime that got measured just start to go up, like uh, several hundred picoseconds up to uh, above nanosecond and so forth. And yeah, and so what was happening is that if you have bad contacts, you know, your, your, you know, your cobalt, which is doing the measurement, is actually invading that material and really junking it up, essentially. Okay, and so, so at least in the first stages of, of this research, it's really how can you make better and better and better tunnel barriers to really start getting into sort of some of the intrinsic properties of the graphene, okay? And nowadays, um, 
things have gotten better. Okay, and then, you know, there's been advances in the modeling, which I won't get into. Okay, so, yes. Okay, we're doing awesome. Okay. Um, yeah, so I will mention that, like, the, right now, the record, uh, the record lifetimes are, like, 12 nanoseconds at room temperature. And the spin diffusion lengths that people can get are on the order of 30 microns or so. So in terms of these properties of any material, this is like the best at room temperature anyway. Okay, so um, let me pause. Any questions from students? This is the basics of spin transport and lifetime measurement. Okay. Yes. If you add a ton of barrier. Yes. Um, no. So I'll, 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 yes, no, and yes. Okay, so I'll, there's a trade off. Okay, so the, what, what people define as the spin injection efficiency is the spin polarization of the injected current. Okay, and for that, it will not make it worse, it actually makes it much better. Okay, so you could get as high as the polarization of the material that you have, like 30 or 40 percent. Okay. But the thing that you lose off is if you, some, some processes you care about spin current, which is polarization times the current, right? So what happens is that as you make it more and more, say, resistive, then you start reducing the spin current. So that's sort of different than the spin injection efficiency, right? So, so there's a trade-off. And so I think if you want to balance those off, you want to have sort of a, a moderately, <laughs> a, somewhere in the middle is ideal. So there's, there's an optimal point, yeah. How thick it should be? Uh, I, it varies. I mean, the, the optimal point is like you'd want like the barrier resistance to be matching like the resistivity of the channel or the spin resistance of the channel. So there's some maxim, maximal point there. Yeah. So there was one other in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Can you go back one Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you mean back here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so like, <laughs> so in the... In, if you apply very high magnetic yeah. field, the signal should be zero. That's right. Why not? Uh, so yeah, so the, it, 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 this one's close to zero, right? Yeah. yeah but why not? Oh, okay, so, so that's actually very old data, and we only had an electromagnet, and this was, yeah. But that's, yeah, if, if we applied larger field, it would hit zero. Yeah, no, no. At the time, you know, this is the highest field that we could have. And so we were nervous that referees would get real irritated by that. But, uh, yeah. So, yeah, it was, ex it was an instrumentation limit at that time. Um, and the thing, the other trend to know, though, is that as your lifetime gets longer, your hand lead gets narrower. So then we're able to get to this zero limit, yeah. But if we, if we were able to apply, let's say, like, you know, 5,000 or 6,000 gas, this for sure would be, you know, at zero. It's a good question. Okay. So um, there's this thing that um, happens inside materials. Uh, it's called spin-orbit coupling. And there's lots of different types. There's like, graphene has some intrinsic types. So Eugene Millet and, and Kane had really, you know, pushed these ideas. I wanted to um, tell you about one type, which is Rashba, which is the easiest one to explain. And this comes from spin-orbit coupling in atoms. And there's different types. Some are called Dresselhaus that are related to the bulk of the material, like you'll have this in gallium arsenide. And then there's other ones that come from interfaces, which is like it's called Rashba. So I'm just going to talk about the second one because it's a little easier to get to. Okay. And, um, you know, I'm going to just think about it a little bit like this. Right. So, you know, imagine if you had some electric field pointing in such direction and then an electron is moving. So this is in the lab frame, right? So this is like the, uh, you know, positively charged particle at rest, like the nucleus, and then an electron's moving around it. And then there's an electric field that comes here. But you can also go into the electron's frame, okay? In, in the electron's frame, then it looks like the electron's at rest, and then it looks like this, you know, nucleus, the charged particle is moving towards you. And so this is a moving charged particle which creates a magnetic field, right? And you do this right-hand rule business, and, and so this guy here is going to create a magnetic field, something that looks like a magnetic field that's pointing out of the screen. 
Right? So this is really like a relativistic kind of effect. If you're in the electron, if you're in the lab frame, there's no magnetic field. If you're in the electrons frame, you get a magnetic field. Right? So this is what you learn about also in your electricity and magnetism courses, how electric field can become a magnetic field. Okay? And of course, it depends on the relative direction of the, veloc the velocity of the electron. If it's moving up, it'll look like such. If it's moving in different directions, it'll look different. Okay? And, and so this kind of field that you get here is, is sort of an internal spin orbit field that comes from this changing reference frames. So this is sort of the spin orbit effect. Okay? And so you can imagine, and, and this, is, this is the Lorentz transformation from your electricity and magnetism class that you might have. But you could imagine that if you're inside of a heterostructure of some sort and your velocity is in a certain direction, you might have an electric field perpendicular to your film. And what happens is you're going to get um, a magnetic field that's going to be perpendicular to those. Okay, so that looks very much like what I showed you here, where there's a velocity pointing up, an electric field pointing to the right, and then the magnetic field, when you go to the electron frame, is perpendicular to both of those. Right? So this cross that will give you the B. Okay? So it's sort of a generalization of that type of thing, that you, you'll get this kind of business here. And yeah, and so what happens is you'll get this extra term inside, so you have this normal energy, which is 1 half mv squared, momentum over 2b. And then you're going to have this term, which describes that type of phenomenon I was, just, I was just describing to you a moment ago. Okay? And then we just imagine that the electric field is pointing out of plane, because we're looking at, say, a 2d sheet. So the electric field can go in that direction. And then your momentum is going to be in plane in the x and y directions. Okay? So you're moving in the xy direction, and you have something that's breaking the symmetry in the z direction. And that's going to create, um, you know, okay, so there's some matrix eigenvalues and stuff, but it's going to create um, um, this type of Hamiltonian which has this kind of solution. And I'm just going to draw, I'm just going to do it by graphically. Here's the answer. So the answer is like this. In these kind of systems, what happens is that um, your, your band, which starts off as something like a Dirac cone, it actually splits into two subbands, which is sort of spin polarized. Okay? And what happens is that one of these bands, your spins are going to be pointing in plane and wanting to be, say, um, circulating clockwise, and then the other direction is going to be circulating counterclockwise. Okay? And so it looks like for these electrons that are, that are moving inside the 2D sheet, depending on what direction you're moving, there's going to be like this kind of internal field. Right? And this internal field is going to affect the spins. Right? And eventually, these can actually because you have these kind of internal fields, you can cause the spins to want to process in all different ways, and you start losing all of your spin polarization. Right? So it's all of this internal spin orbit field can cause all your spins to go away. OK. OK. So this is, this is like what you would have inside graphene. Here's your, here's your Dirac cone. And then when you have some type of spin orbit coupling, it takes each of the Dirac cones and splits it up into two. And then there's like sort of like a counterclockwise and a clockwise. So if you look here, it looks like you have a magnetic field that's pointing in plane. And every electron is going to see sort of a different field, and it's going to start randomizing the spins in different ways. OK? OK. So um, let, me, let me pause. This was a little bit more technical, and I kind of went through it a little bit on the quick side. But are there, I want to stop here. Are there any sort of questions about the spin orbit coupling? Yeah. This is maybe too big of a question yeah. for now, but so you have these two cones that are separated, mm -hmm. they're spin polarized. Right? Mm -hmm. How do you detect that uh, just kind of in a broad sense? Right? That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> So um, yeah, I want to I want to like um, tear open I want to tear open another file which is my paper I'm working on that we want to get on the archive within this next week. Um, so I'll tell you roughly roughly speaking. So something that's happening in the field is trying to um, control the spin orbit coupling, not just what is given to you in graphene or whatnot. I mean, how do you, you know, there's an idea that if you can control the spin orbit field, it's like you can, with an electrical voltage, 
you know, cause the spins to change direction in some controlled way, right? And so there was like these ideas of Dada and DOS, like in 1990, these spin transistors, you apply an electric field, you could change the spin orbit coupling, and you could cause these guys to, you know, process in some coherent kind of way. Um, and so what's, what's been happening is that um, groups have been trying to figure out how do you control, you know, you know, these spins, you inject them and they go from one point to another and it's like really cool to do that. But if you could manipulate this state, it would be great. And so people start imagining a couple of ways. The one is like, let's say you take graphene and then you slap on it some TMD, right? And the TMD has huge spin orbit coupling and maybe by proximity you can actually, you know, um, you know, induce some spin orbit coupling from the neighboring TMD and then start changing the, the precession properties, okay? And so there's a series of experiments where we, we do injection and detection and you try to do this kind of Hanley precession. And what happens is like the presence of um, the spin orbit coupling is going to really change what the precession looks like. Um, so that's a way to do it. I mean, so when people started looking at this kind of induced spin orbit coupling, first people said, oh, let's do weak localization because, you know, weak localization has some models and it'll flip over if there's spin orbit coupling. So there's been various ways, but they're kind of indirect. And just about within the last year, people have been able to, you know, for example, the lifetime of my spin that's out of plane versus lifetime that's spin in plane. If you don't have spin orbit coupling, they're all going to be pretty similar. But if you can create a, a, a big spin orbit coupling that has a certain preferred axis, then the out of plane and in plane will be quite different. And so those experiments were first just came out in the last half year or so, right? And so we're, uh, it turns out, um, and then, and then, of course, what people want to do now is to use electrical gates and see if you could use the gates to control the spin orbit coupling. And um, <laughs> it turns out you could do that in bilayer graphene. And it's like kind of, well, how to put it? Like a preprint came out last Friday, and so we we're working very hard to submit our paper like this week. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, this, that's a very, very, very nice topic. Um, I'm going to actually skip this thing here. Okay, so I'm doing good on time. So, um, yeah, I really want to tear into this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the la oh, yeah, over the weekend, we've been, I was working with my student to write this paper really, really fast. Our data is better than what's on the archive right now. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, I c I'll be happy to talk to anybody about this later if you want to. Um, so, I do want to sort of turn to a couple of really cool um, experiments. And one is um, doing optospintronics with TMD and graphene. And let me, let me just tell you the experiment. I'm going to sort of flip through it really quick, but I want to tell you the experiment, okay? It's like you have a TMD on top and a graphene on the bottom. And the graphene is a whole spin valve, right? And the graphene, it has very low spin orbit coupling. There's no coupling between helicity of light um, to the spin of the graphene. But it turns out that the TMD is very well known. If you have circular polarized light, you're going to create a valley polarized um, exciton, and, and that is also spin polarized. So the idea is let's like take the hetero structure, okay? Use the, use the TMD to create the spin polarization, and then let's try to get it into the graphene. And then once it's in the graphene, it can move around, and let's detect it with these ferromagnets, just like we did. Okay, so that's the upshot of this whole section, right? And so we are able to do that. And it's like totally proven. And what I'll do is I will, for sake of time actually, because I want to spend most of it on this last part, which is ferromagnetism, um, <laughs> I will get to that. Um, but that's what that part's going to be about. Um, before I get to that, I'll just mention, you know, 24 micron spin diffusion length. If you apply electric fields, you could go 90 microns. Spin lifetime's 12 nanoseconds. There's some thoughts of some ways to... Uh, you know, use this in circuits for, you know, um, memory and logic and so forth. I won't go into that too much. We've done quite a bit of work on this direction. But I do want to tell you about um, the fact that, you know, beyond graphene, uh, with heterostructure, so we've only talked so much about the graphene part here, but there's ferromagnets that are both two-dimensional and three-dimensional, which would be really great to integrate with graphene. There's these transition metal dichalcogenides, which have valley polarization and spin polarization and very good for optics. And there's also these topological materials, these 2D and 3D topological materials. And yeah, okay, so 
since we're in a 2D sort of workshop, yeah, you can stack all these together and then you, know, you combine these various properties by stacking vertically or proximity effects, okay? And yeah, so this, so this optospintronics part is really about stacking the TMD and graphene. Take advantage of the optical properties of TMD and the really good spin transport properties of the graphene, okay? And you know, we wanna just get all the best advantages here. So this is all introductory stuff. Okay, so this is the experiment. We, we, we excite uh, spin polarization in the MOS2 with circularly polarized light. Um, connect it to the graphene and we want the stuff to go from one type of 2D material to another. And then we're gonna actually use this trick of applying a magnetic field in plane because these spins are pointing out of plane and we want them to tilt towards in plane where we could detect it with our in plane ferromagnet. Okay, and yes, so let's go ahead and do that. We do some characterization. Well, he, well there's, a, there's a whole device here with ferromagnetic electrodes and here's where the graphene MOS2 is and that's where we're gonna shine the light, right? And then um, and these are just the electrical characteristics. But we're gonna optically excite it right at this point here, okay? And, and this is it. So my student animated this. So right now, zero field, no signal. Apply a field, okay? Now you get a component and then you start seeing this thing come in. And then if you over, if you apply too big of a field, it's gonna go over, over rotate and it's gonna start coming back down. And then so this kind of curved shape, this is like a anti-symmetric Hanley because they start off at 90 degrees apart. Yeah, but when, you see, we, when we saw this, we're like, okay, this for sure has to come from spin, not from some kind of artifact, right? So yeah, so I won't go into much more detail about that, but this is really showing and this is like the first time for spins in two different types of 2D materials, going from one material to another one. Okay, yes. And then you, when you, if you flip the magnetization, if you flip the magnetization of your ferromagnet, all the signals should flip over, and they do. So that's the red curve. Yeah, so we did a lot of checks, and this is like really neat. So this, this whole area of optospintronics is just a new direction that's just opening up. So we're really excited about that. Okay, so I'm gonna just skip it works at room temperature, great, okay. Um, there's modeling, also fine. Uh, more, more stuff, a lot of open questions, exciting. Okay, but I do want to get to this last part. <laughs> so this stuff actually very, very exciting, but you know, I'm looking at my clock here and I do want to go into some detail about some of the materials growth and developing 2D magnets. So we know like last year there was a couple of papers, one by Xiao Dangxu's group, one by Shang Zhang's group, where they actually exfoliating materials down to single monolayers, bilayers, and so forth, and looking at the magnetic properties of these sort of monolayer magnets. And it turns out they're ferromagnetic, but always at low temperature, right? So we wanna have things that work at higher temperatures, like room temperature. And I'll, I'm gonna show you, um, you know, we actually, it took us about a, over a year for us to convince ourselves that what we have is real. Okay, so we actually have this and those papers are coming out. We're like, no, no, but we got to make sure we do all the proper characterizations. So, so this is work by um, Xiao Dangxu, which shows a very nice uh, magnetic hysteresis loop measured by Moke in chromium triiodide. And also CGT shows some reasonably good uh, hysteresis loops, but they're sort of at low temperatures. And um, there was this work that actually caught my attention a lot. It's by Jacek Ferdinus group in Notre Dame where they're trying to put in a little bit of um, manganese inside tin selenide, and they're able to do it. And, you know, um, these are the read patterns that look fine. And then you look here, there's a signal at room temperature. Low temperature looks a little better, but here it is. And I thought, wow, you know, this is a system that shows some signal, and having a signal is better than having no signal when you're starting a project. So I said, we should start looking into this. And it's the room temperature as well. Um, the only problem was that it was like 0.09 Bohr magnetons per manganese, which is tiny. It's tiny, right? Um, and th there was speculation that, okay, maybe this is an anti magnet that's canted a little bit, so this tiny moment is like some residual thing that doesn't cancel off. So we're like, okay, that may be the case, but let's go ahead and, you know, put this in our chamber, because we just, it's a new chamber, let's put some stuff in it. Okay, and it turns out, um, this is sort of after the fact, but, um, Turns out there's DFT, a, lot of D, a number of DFT studies that look at monolayer magnets of many different compositions. 
And it turns out the, the, the manganese uh, diselenide, if it's a 1T phase, that's predicted to be ferromagnet at, at, with pretty big exchange splitting, so it could be at high temperatures. And the moment should be about 3 bore magneton per manganese. And sort of the problem is that manganese diselenide and manganese monoselenide, most times you have manganese and selenium, it becomes antiferromagnetic. That's just, and people have told me, you must be wrong, because it's always antiferromagnetic, okay? But, um, but this is a, a quite a bit of a different system. And then I also want to point out, so our work came out a couple of months ago, a couple of months before that, there was a group that did v vanadium diselenide. It's actually very similar. Um, so I think these two, manganese and vanadium diselenide, are both really interesting systems uh, looking forward, okay? And um, here's the thing that's kind of cool. Um, and we, it's, we didn't understand this till definitely midway through the project. So um, here's different kind of manganese, selen manganese selenium compounds, okay? So this is uh, a ferromagnetic one, which is from theory. And if you look from the side, you see these two layers of selenium and you see the manganese in the middle, right? And so one T structured, this tetragonal structure. And the in-plane lattice constant, according to theory, is like 3.66 angstrom. So that's what that looks like. There's a bulk manganese diselenide, which is antiferromagnetic. It looks like this. It's a pyrite structure, so it's like iron pyrite kind of stuff, okay? And then the in-plane, if you look in the 111, the in-plane is going to be 4.5 angstrom. So this is kind of looks really different, okay? Um, this one here, manganese selenide, it's a rock salt, it's like sodium chloride. This is, this is like nickel oxide or cobalt oxide, okay? And then it's an antiferromagnet, but it's antiferromagnet in a really interesting way. It's like these 111 planes are ferromagnets. So I don't know how well you can see it, but this plane here is um, everything is spin aligned the same way. And then this one, this plane here, is aligned on the opposite direction. So it's like layered antiferromagnet, okay? And then, you know, the, you can have different kind of domains because those layers could be in this way or that way or that way, okay? But that's the basic thing. And if you look, if you just look here, this structure actually matches that structure. So if you're able to grow this material and sort of stop at one monolayer, you're like, I have that stuff too. It's like the same thing, right? And so they have a matching structure and then they also have a matching magnetism. Like this is supposed to be ferromagnetic and this plane is ferromagnetic. So they're not that different, okay? Um, yeah, so this is, this is the hope um, in the end. So let me show you some of the, the growths. So we start with gallium arsenide, then we grow gallium selenide. It turns out to grow well. You can see the streaks. And then we grow on top of that this, uh, you know, one monolayer's worth of manganese diselenide and it grows, so that's good. Um, we do it on tin selenide as well, and it grows okay. Different substrate. Okay, so but here's the magnetic property. Um, and we, we've seen this like long, long time ago. Um, but, um, you know, if we look here, this is, uh, this is on the gallium selenide base layer. This is the raw data. Okay, so this is the raw data. And of course, there's some kind of background signals that you always get in squids. And then, um, and then here's what you have left. And you, you can definitely see in the raw data, you already see the hysteresis. And these are at room temperature. And then you have, you have a hysteresis loop that looks like that. This is with the magnetization out of plane. We can also get a signal in plane. Um, and then this is on other substrate, tin diselenide. And it's not exactly the same, but it's similar. But you can definitely see there's hysteresis at room temperature. Right, so we're observing room temperature for our magnetism in manganese diselenide. And the, and the magnetic moment that we extract is about three or four, about four bore magnetons per manganese. Okay, so that's pretty nice. Feeling good. Okay, um, but actually we had to do some control measurements because we weren't so sure. And it's good to do. And um, so this is the, the top panel is the raw data for three samples. One of them is we do everything the same, but we don't open up the manganese ever. And the second one, we don't, also don't open up the manganese. And the third one, we open up the manganese. Okay, and that's the raw data. Um, and cold means that the effusion cell, we, we cool it down. So it's not at deposition uh, temperatures. And hot is where we have the manganese that's hot. And one, one thing that we've learned is that if the effusion cell is hot, it's sort of like you some, there's some background of manganese in the chamber. We just, we just know this from, other, from studies on other materials. And then what, what we find is that we have three components. We have a diamagnetic component from the substrate. 
And then there's some kind of paramagnetic component. And I guess the point I want to make here is that over here, we have the ferromagnetism. Okay? Over here, when we don't open the manganese, we don't have like the same kind of ferromagnetic component. Like this is big. There might be some tiny thing here. And there's really nothing here. Okay? And then the other thing is, you know, oh, in addition to this diamagnetic, you have a paramagnetic component. And you can sort of see the paramagnetic component, whether you open it or not, you, you have a, a pretty similar and substantial amount of paramagnetism. And this is probably, my guess is that it's, it's coming from the base layer of gallium selenide. Maybe there's some, you know, dilute manganese inside there. Yeah. But then, but then if you have the manganese cold, then you have much smaller paramagnetic component. So this is probably what's going on. Okay, and then, if we, and then the thing that we do is, well, let's say, how thick can we grow this material? So we grew a monolayer, but it turns out you can keep growing. And I told my student, like, hey, let's grow more layers. Let's just see how this goes. Two layers, three layers. And I said, please, because I was working, volunteering at the high school. I said, look, um, give me a call when it goes bad. Just when it, when, it, when it all goes bad, just give me a call. And then, like, an hour later, he hasn't called me. I was like, my god, give me a call already. <laughs> so I called him up, um, and I said, hey, actually, you're supposed to call me when it goes bad. So, like, why, why didn't you call me? <laughs> it's like, it's, it hasn't gone bad. It's still going good. So, so it turns out you can just keep on growing this material really thick. And what we learned, what we learned is that um, when X-ray diffraction, we see this big peak. And this is from actually alpha manganese selenide 111. So it, it converts from... You know, whatever is growing at the start, it becomes this rock salt phase and it becomes very thick and actually stays of good quality. And then there's another peak here which is consistent with TMDs and so forth. Okay, but let me just keep going here. And then if you look at the magnetic property of this really thick manganese selenide layer, you get um, this curve. You get, you, get this, you get this curve. And it turns out, if you, this is like the moment per area. So this is like the total magnetic moment on this per, per area. So, if you, so this is a good comparison. So if you look at this gray part here, this is the one monolayer manganese selenide that I showed you before. If you go to this really thick layer, even though it's like the thickness is 100 times bigger, the magnetic moment is only increased by like a factor of two. So it's probably all coming from interface. And then after a little while, it converts to this rock salt non-ferromagnetic phase. Okay, so what do we have here? Okay, so we think ferromagnetism coming from interface. Okay. And then there's some TEMs, which are beautiful TEMs, which was very hard for our collaborator to get. Um, but yeah, so here is where you have the gallium selenide base layer. You have the manganese selenide top layer that's very thick. And you zoom in on the interface. And the thing about it, the main things about it is that the interface is really sharp. You can sort of see this gallium selenide looks a certain way. The alpha manganese selenide looks like another way. And there's some interfacial region that looks a little bit different in between. But it's not really junky, junked up. It's very sharp and clean interfaces that we're getting, right? And so, and so there's really only two possibilities that's consistent with this microscopy. One is the presence of this 1T manganese diselenide at the interface. And the other possibility is just the direct transition from gallium selenide to this alpha manganese selenide. So these are sort of the two possibilities. And it turns out if you look very closely at the bulk material and you look at the van der Waals material, they are different. But if you're looking at the first monolayer, actually these two possibilities uh, turn out to be the same, right? I mean, maybe the bond angles are a little bit different because this doesn't require the, it to be a cubic structure. But for the most part, you know, these two possibilities are the same. So for these one monolayer samples, um, we believe that this ferromagnetism is really coming from the 1T manganese diselenide phase. Okay, so the next steps um, are very exciting steps. It's to try to you know, grow these monolayers on some substrates and actually use the STM. And you just go in with like a spin polarized tip, so like a magnetic tip. And this, in this case, the tip is chromium. So chromium is like the most popular tip because it's anti-ferromagnet, but it's still spin polarized, okay? And we've just been able to very recently, and we're doing this in collaboration with Jay Gupta's group at Ohio State. So um, you can look at chromium 1001 it's like uh, atomic steps, and it's a layered antiferromagnet at the surface. So your magnetic moment is switching between one direction and the other. So if you take the STM, and then you're going to look at the topography, you'll see like, oh, there's nice atomic steps. But then if you look at, um, at a particular um, spectroscopy condition, and this is like a DIDV map, 
you can sort of see it's light over here, and then it's dark over here, and then it's light over here and dark over here, over the same regions. And so what's happening is that you're seeing the magnetic domains going back from one direction to the other, right? And just in the past month or so, we've been able to cleanly transfer from our MBE chamber into the STM and get atomic resolution like routinely. So we're really getting uh, to the place where we could look at the magnetism and if there's any kind of interesting spin textures, like the spins are you know, winding in interesting ways, then we should be able to actually image that directly. And that would be like super cool. Okay, so this is great. This is great. So I have t time for if there's questions. So um, first of all, the first part we had some tutorial about spins in graphene and so forth. Um, the second part, I, I went a little bit quick, but I talked about this optovalletronic spin injection where we're injecting spins and detecting them electrically in the graphene. And then this last part, um, telling you about this room temperature ferromagnetism magnetism that we observe in manganese disalonide. And if we couple that to vanadium disalonide and also look at alloy structures, you know, I think there's uh, a lot of exciting work that can be done in all of these realms, both for spintronics and valetronics, uh, in new 2D materials, and also in heterostructures. That's all. Thanks. Questions? Do you know what the uh, Curie temperature is in your, uh, uh, these 2Ds, uh, the, the manganese solenoid? No, no. I mean, we haven't taken it hotter. Yeah, we, yeah. 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 Um, manganese solenoid is an insulator or is, is it a conductor? Manganese selenide is an insulator, actually. Um, let me sh oops. Yeah, we, have, we actually have some spectroscopy. Um, this might be good here. Yeah, so, yeah. So this is, this is uh, some STM images that we have. This is the gallium selenide, and when we do the spectroscopy, that has a, shows a gap of about two EVs. And then this is when we have like three monolayers of the material, and this, Okay, for some reason we couldn't do the mono layer because of our transferring wasn't clean. Um, our vacuum transferring wasn't clean. But we can get these th three mono layers, um, and when we, we can see the atomic resolution, and the spectroscopy shows even a bigger gap, it's like 3.4, and that's typical for what people have in um, manganese selenide. So that's an insulating system. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, we did, so, so the data I showed you was for out-of-plane hysteresis loops. And then we also have um, data for in-plane hysteresis loops. Um, and they're pretty similar. But when we compare, when we compare um, the, the two substrates, it looks like, it looks like, um, Uh, it's, uh, it, it looks, it, I might get this backwards. It looks like there's a slight out of plane easy axis. That's what it, it looks like. I mean, I think uh, the tin diselenide, the in plane loops are wider. So, so that's a little, probably harder axis uh, in plane. So it's probably slightly out of plane easy axis. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we, uh, um, why don't we make sure that we give people a chance at a break. Um, so um, let's uh, stop there. You can ask uh, questions uh, um, during the break, and uh, we'll reconvene uh, for the last talks at 3 channels.